We have six student presenters in this session. Gideon Ihim from Michael Akpara University of Agriculture. Janice E. Fang Tay from UCSI University of Malaysia. Oscar Sarazzi from Texas Tech University. Elisa Price from University of Wollongong. PhD candidate Pei Zhou from Pennsylvania State University. And Okan Esther from Michael Akpara University of Agriculture. Before I move forward and hear from them, I would like to give some housekeeping announcements. Parts of the session are being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. Please modify your name and or shut off your video if you do not wish to be recorded. We ask that all attendees keep their audio off unless prompted during a question and answer period. The Q&A will happen at the end after all six presentations and you can put your questions in the chat. We will be finishing the session 10 minutes before the hour to allow a short break before the next session. Thank you. Thank you. So to start us off, let me introduce Gideon Ihim from Michael Akpara University of Agriculture. All right, thank you very much. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Gideon Iheme from Michael Akpara University of Agriculture. And um, I would be compliance of priest nutrition label and of interest uh, study back that time that the nutrition transition also came with the epidemiological transition at um, it is we are no longer in countries like Africa um, you know the high chance of uh, uncommunicable is shown that in this was project such see after the uh, the ability adjusted life uh, owing to non communicable diseases and in Nigeria more than a third uh, about it close to a of, uh, total adults attributed to communicable uh, oh no, so we will try to get Gideon back up on here. Um, I guess in the meantime, we can move on to our second presenter while we um, figure out his um, Wi-Fi issues. Um, so now let me yes. introduce, oh, is Gideon back on? Okay, so sorry about that. Gideon, we can share your slides for you, and you can keep your camera off to use your bandwidth that. if that works. I'm sorry. I think I had the network. All right. Okay. I tried to share and then just keep my camera off. I think that. Was, I think that. Was, I think that. Was, uh, all right. So please, can you confirm that you? Can hear me? And um, please, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you, but the sound is very choppy. So we were thinking, let's try it with your camera off, and we can share our uh, we can share the slides you sent us, and maybe that will help. We can try. But we can't hear you now. Gideon, are you still there? We can't hear you now. Okay, all right. Yeah. Let's go here. Okay, um, can another person come on? Maybe I will try to work on my band and I'll uh, come back later. Okay, that sounds good. And maybe, I don't know if you have the option to call in. Um, I can send you a quick email with the phone information if needed. 
I will actually just work on my bandwidth. Uh, it will be good. Just sorry about that. Apologies. That's all right. Um, Thank you. Okay, so we will move on to Janice Yifeng Tay from UCSI University of Malaysia. Go ahead, Janice. Yeah, so the slide is shared, right? So it's clear, yeah? So hi everyone, this is Janice Tay from UCSI University, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to share my study uh, with a title, Fast Food and Street Food Exposure Associated with the Dead Quality of Urban Poor Adolescents in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So before I start the uh, presentation, I would like to mention that there is no conflict to disclose in this presentation. Let's start with the research background. The geographical distribution of the food outlet, including the availability and also the accessibility, is the important factors that can affect the diet quality, which means when the surrounding area has a sufficient of healthy food that is readily available and also accessible, the individuals tend to consume and also practice healthier dietary behavior. While the urban food adolescents having poor diet quality, the food environment, they are uh, known to be unhealthy, which means they are high fat, high salt and high sugar food outlets, including like the uh, fast food and also street food can further exacerbate this kind of situation. So there is limited evidence that how this association in Malaysia context. So with this, it is of interest to determine the association between fast food and also street food exposure with the gadai quality of the urban poor adolescents in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So this is a cross-sectional study that conducted between June to September 2022 that involving adolescents aged 10 to 17 years old from 12 Google Housing Program PPR in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Prior to the data collection, study approval including the ministry and also articles approval were obtained. The subjects were recorded using multi-stage stratified random sampling method and the diet quality, and the diet quality were assessed using two days, 24, 24 hour dietary recall and the diet data will be later uh, into the nutritionist pro software for the analysis and further translated into standardized Malaysian health indeed healthy eating index SMHEI to determine their diet quality level, which can be further categorized into poor diet quality that require improvement and also good diet. The, whereas for the special data, the fast food and also street food outlet, including their density and also the closest proximity will be determined using the handheld GIS device to determine the, uh, the amount of the, to determine the amount of the uh, fast food and also street food outlet and also the, the distance to the PPR with a buffer of 1 km and this data will be further analyzed in the QGIS. And lastly, statistical analysis will be performed using SPSS in which the descriptive analysis and also generalized estimating equation model will be performed. Uh, there are a total of 164 of subjects recruited and participate in this study. And, and the urban poor adolescents have a mean S and HEI score of 48.6, which is under the category of poor diet quality. Whereas for the food outlet, street food was found to have a highest number of the uh, vendor as compared to the fast food, and they are more close to the PPR, the residential area, as compared to the fast food. So in other way, the, the adolescents tend to have higher accessibility and also the availability towards street food as compared to the fast food. Whereas for the generalizing, generalized estimated equation model revealed that the closest proximity of the fast food and also street food was positively associated with the uh, diet quality after adjustment of the confounder, including the adolescent sex, age, monthly household income, and also household size. In other words, the uh, the nearest the the nearest the fast food and also street food vendor to the to the residential area, they tend to be have a poor diet quality. 
the main key text way of the study is that the proximity, also known as accessibility of this fast food and also street food, but not the density, was associated with the diet quality of the adolescent that's residing in urban poor areas. Implication for specific policy recommendations need to considering the proximity of the fast food and also street food while promoting the healthy food environment, which is very important in order to achieve the optimal diet quality of the urban poor adolescents. For example, it is suggested to minimize the access to the fast food and also street food in the urban poor area, or perhaps can provide an alternative healthier food choice in fast food and also street food outlet. Before I end the presentation, I would like to express my gratitude to all the relevant authorities and subjects for the efforts and the time involved in the study. And this research was supported by the Fundamental Research Grant Scheme under the Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. That was a great presentation. So now I'd like to introduce Oscar Saratse from Texas Tech University. Hello, everybody. So I'm Oscar Saratse from Texas Tech University. And I will going to present you about the no the effects of novel comparables in the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables in the United States population. Okay. Uh, I shall mention that this is a working paper, so every comment or suggestion is more than welcome. And the paper is with my advisor and one of my committee members, and we have no financial disclosure or conflicts of interest for this presentation. So starting, uh, the worker organization as you know, is the entity in charge of what will be a healthy eating index or what we should eat to have a healthy diet. Here in the United States, uh, we are mostly uh, driven by diet dietary guidelines. Uh, the dietary guideline for Americans tells how much you should consume of fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, grains, protein. And with that, uh, they, they are looking to improve a population diet and prevent the appearance of some disease that are non communicable like diabetes type 2, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. So the background for, for our project is like, here in the United States, one of three Americans consume fast food right in the regular basis. The fruits and vegetable consumption has remained low in the time. Uh, we can see Lee at all. In 2017, they measured the the fruit and vegetable consumption according to the dietary guideline for Americans. They found out that 13% of Americans consume what is recommended in fruits and 9% in vegetables. And those numbers didn't change too much in 2019 since they found 12% and 10% restricted. And also we can notice that in the market, the healthy food options usually cost 14% more than the healthful options, than the healthful options. So it's cheaper to get a burger than is than getting a salad, basically. So that makes like a demographic, a, a, so a economic demographic, like income and availability harder to people to have a healthy diet. A, and mostly this problem is that the non-communicable disease appears later in life. So this is a problem that should be attacked in the early stages of life. So it should be attacked when there are kids. So that way they, we can promote a healthier diet. But so far, what we found in the literature is most of the literature conducted has been in the economic demographics like income and in this region they are located, if there is a food swamp or a food desert, things like that. So what we don't found is that there are no income inside like, let's say exercise or people like or not fruits and vegetables that actually influence the consumption of fruits and vegetables. So with that, we have our objectives that we want to know what are the behavioral and convenience factors that influence the consumption of uh, fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables according to the dietary guidelines for Americans. What are the demographic factors that affect liking fruits and vegetables? And that uh, the consumption part uh, is different across income or ethnicity variables. So for this, what we did is we collected data for more than 4,000 households in the United States. We use a survey, our exclusion criteria was people 18 years and older, they need to complete the whole survey and they need they need to be in charge of their purchasing decisions of their household. 
Uh, our survey was divided in five sections. The first section included demographic characteristics like gender, age, race, uh, the household food purchasing behavior, uh, where they do their purchases. They go to Walmart, they go to Costco, things like that. Uh, the household fruit and vegetable consumption behavior. Uh, they consume fresh fruits. They consume fresh vegetables, canned fruits. The dietary guideline for America, uh, mostly they are saying if you consume 2.5 cups of fresh fruits daily. And we want to know the, the behavior of the person. That means if they do exercise, they are vegetarian, they have disponibility for a car. Are they, the perception of themselves is healthy or not? So here we have an example uh, of our, our primary, primary research. We saw that most of the people uh, prepare home meals. Uh, uh, more than less than fifty percent of the people didn't consume fast food the previous day, contrary to consuming soft drinks. More than fifty percent. And something we need to highlight is that a lot of people do a lot of workout at least three times a week or more. More than fifty percent of our sample. So for measuring what is the impact of these no income factors, we are using a Heckman profit model. What is a Heckman profit model? It's basically a two-step approach. It consists of a selection model that, that is how likely are you to be part of the auto model? That is the second part. Uh, let's say if we're talking about labor participation, how likely are you to be in labor participation and your auto model will be, uh, what will be your, your estimated salary? So the adaptation we did is like, uh, what is your likelihood for liking fruits and vegetables? And the likelihood of liking fruits and vegetables actually affect your consumption of fruits and vegetables. So our, the, of our preliminary result, what we saw is that sociodemographic factors affecting the consumption of fruits and vegetables. We found that is race, black, uh, black race household head tend to have more consumption of fruits and vegetables. Income is one of those, Hispanic race. But the most interesting part in the outcome model that is if they consume or not fruits and vegetables so they fulfill the dietary guidelines for Americans, is we found that being unemployed decreases your probability of consuming uh, fruits and vegetables or the or consume the dietary guidelines. Uh, preparing home meals actually increases your probability of consuming fruits and vegetables. Being vegetarian uh, increases your probability of consuming fruits and vegetables. And working out results to be statistically significant for the three groups, for the three models we run. So people that work out actually consume more fruits and vegetables. Something that we found as well is that the body mass index, since we consider height and weight, actually decrease your probability of consuming fruits and vegetables. That means if you have a higher body mass index, you are less likely to consume fruits and vegetables. So what, so what we found so far is that, in fact, there are no income variables that affect the consumption of fruits and vegetables that we saw so as body mass, mass index or preparing home meals. And what we want to do with these, uh, with these results is what we should, what would the policymakers should target in order to make, to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables in the population. In that way, they can reduce the spread of non-communicable diseases that can result in a better uh, in a better life in the future of the people. Thank you. If you have questions or contact information, there is my name. Awesome. Thank you, Oscar. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone too, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat um, and we can get to them after all the presentations. So now I would like to um, announce Elisa Price from University of Wollongong. Thank you. Okay, good evening. My name is Alyssa Price and today I am discussing why foods high in whole grains should not be considered ultra processed. Before I get started, I would like to thank my wonderful supervisors in Australia and my very supportive working group here in Boston. 
We know that chronic diseases exist as a large health challenge globally, particularly in both Australia and the United States. And a poor diet is one of the top five contributing risk factors for developing a chronic disease. And that's a diet that's typically low in whole grains and fruit and vegetables. A lot of evidence exists linking high intake of whole grains with reduced risk of heart disease, diabetes, colon cancer, and diverticular disease, to name a few. So how do we promote the intake of whole grain foods? Well, firstly, we have the Australian Dietary Guidelines, and they recommend to enjoy a wide variety of nutritious foods from our five core food groups. And our grain foods actually exist as our largest core group, and they recommend to consume mostly whole grain varieties. In the American Dietary Guidelines, they um, describe a healthy dietary pattern to include whole grains and suggest that at least half of total grain intake should be whole grains as well. Despite this, both Australians and the US do not currently meet whole grain intake recommendations daily. So what are some other ways that we provide messaging regarding healthful food items? We have nutrient profiling systems. So in Australia, we have the Health Star Rating, which is a front of pack food labeling system. Um, and it gives a food item um, from half a star to five stars based on the overall nutritional profile of the food. So the more stars, the healthier the food item. Increasing in popularity is the Nova Food Classification System. And this groups foods based on their level of processing. And our focus is the ultra processed food groups, so group four on the screen there. And that's because there's a lot of evidence exists, um, a lot of cross-sectional evidence that exists linking high intake of these foods with the chronic disease risk outcomes. So what are our concerns? Our main concerns is that there are some anomalies that exist between these food messaging systems, particularly related to high whole grain containing foods. So for example, this popular Australian breakfast item is 97% whole grain, low in sugar and high in fiber. Because of that, it's recommended as a core food in our dietary guidelines. It receives a five-star health star rating. And as mentioned, it's 97% whole grain, low in sugar and salt, and is fortified with essential nutrients. Despite this, it is currently classified as ultra-processed according to NOVA, and intake is discouraged. This is of particular concern, especially in Australia, as our main um, sources of whole grain foods are our ready-to-eat uh, breakfast cereals, as well as commercial breads. Therefore, the aim of our research was to investigate the association between ultra-processed food intake and chronic disease risk outcomes. And we did this using whole grain modified bird, uh, classifications of an ultra-processed food. We hypothesize that foods high in whole grain are not contributing to the associations um, shown between ultra-processed food intake and chronic disease risk outcomes. Uh, so we firstly utilized um, the Australian NOVA database and the NHANES NOVA database to identify ultra-processed foods in respective um, population surveys. Um, to to develop our whole grain modified um, classifications of ultra processed foods, we use the global consensus of a whole grain food. And this was developed by the Whole Grain Initiative um, and recently published. So they define a whole grain food as being at least 50% whole grain ingredients based on dry weight and allow front of pack labeling if the food is more, more than 25% whole grain. This was, um, or just took a little bit longer with our US and Haynes um, database um, as we had to convert our, the ounce equivalents to um, grams per 100 grams. From here, we classified participants into quintiles um, based on the proportion of energy they were getting from ultra processed foods and completed linear regressions. Outcomes of interest were whole grain intake, weight, BMI, waist circumference, weight to height ratio, and blood pressure. And we also had some biochemical outcomes of interest. However, um, these analyses are still underway at the moment. Our preliminary results for the Australian population found that the higher ultra-processed food intake, our participants were more likely to be younger, more likely to be current smokers, live in Australia or born in Australia, sorry, um, have high sodium intake and a low whole grain intake. Our regression showed that um, high ultra-processed food intake was associated with an increased body weight, BMI, and waist circumference. And finally, our overall or our key finding was that we see the same associations across all three 
data sets, even when we've recategorized um, high whole grain containing foods um, as non ultra processed. So what that tells us is, as we expected, these high whole grain containing foods that are considered ultra processed are not contributing to these associations between ultra processed food intake and these um, chronic disease risk outcomes. So that tells us that the health benefits of whole grains are greater than any potential minor um, negative effects of processing. And one might even argue that this processing is integral to facilitate the intake of these whole grain foods. And finally, we just advocate for agreement across dietary messaging models regarding whole grains, and that's to aid consumer and health professional understanding in promoting their intake um, with the aim to increase intake at the population level. Thank you.